is it an injection and like how often what kind of dose yeah, right now we are just um, maximizing the opportunity for signal mm. by injecting twice a week for four weeks into one leg, the quadriceps. And uh, these individuals can't um, locomote and uh, it's because they have knee osteoarthritis. So they they're, uh, have very limited locomotor uh, uh, abilities and uh, they're older. So they're naturally sarcopenic, which means muscle atrophy with age. So they have two... Uh, things causing their muscles to shrink and they lose a lot of muscle very quickly during that period of time. So we want to just inject one leg only in order to maximize the chances of seeing an effect. Mm -hmm. After that, of course, we would broaden it out to perhaps subcutaneous needle injections. But um, <clears throat> for a first in human, we're trying to maximize it by concentrating it into one large muscle group. So we pick the quadricep and uh, we see a beautiful signal there. But it's important to recognize that the muscle is a, it's like a leaky bag. It's highly vascularized. So whatever drug you put into a muscle, it goes everywhere pretty quickly. That's called systemic, your whole mm -hmm. system. So like in the mice, we're also seeing a systemic effect in the humans. And that's a good thing in this case, because mm -hmm. a, a modulated immune system is healthy for an old person. It's very healthy for a young person. You know, we get dysregulated with age. This is helping it get better you know, demonstrably uh, decreasing high, high levels of pro-inflammation in these humans. So we know it's leaking into the system and that's good. That's not a bad thing, but it is concentrated. So we are seeing concentrated effects in the leg. Like for example, the muscle growth in the injected leg is bigger than the non-injected leg. But interestingly, the other leg is also getting bigger. You know, this is pretty cool. You know, you're growing muscle in a 70 year old human without exercise. <laughs> yeah yes it's pretty so, wild are, it is are, are you looking at the the knee the arthritis in the knee is that improving or is that something you're looking at <clears throat> you know we are not treating knee osteoarthritis right we are simply using it as an immobilizing event mm -hmm. we would use casts but not a lot of 70 year olds are out playing uh, soccer and break their legs and arms so uh so we're we're using you know, older right. people with an immobilization injury as the knee osteoarthritis. Interestingly, um, of course, we're using very sensitive uh, MRI to measure the volume mm -hmm. of their muscle. It's not just, you know, outlining with crayon on a picture. It's a very, very uh, um, exact ways of measuring the muscle fat and the muscle volume and circulation and everything. But we also captured the patella, the kneecap. That's mm -hmm. an isolated bone. It's just sitting there connected with cartilage under an MRI. It looks like a floating bone. And, uh, you know, very interestingly, we're seeing some increase in bone density in these people as well. So it's, I want to caution that it's early days in that mm -hmm. we've only got a handful of, of patients. There's only nine humans in our entirety of our phase one to a clinical trial. We're primarily testing safety. That's the phase one portion, mm -hmm. but you know, this being the 17th clinical trial that I've run with my teams, uh, we're quite good at it. And we talked to the FDA and asked, while we are subjecting humans to this as a safety, please let us, in a very articulate manner, determine whether it works. And the FDA is a bunch of very smart people that work very, very hard. And um, they agreed <clears throat> and allowed us to capture these multiple uh, measurements of efficacy so it's been very, very fun to see the, uh, you know, pain go down and the inflammatory markers go mm -hmm. down. Their, their bones getting more depth. Their muscles are getting larger. We're not measuring metabolism, but I can say that the recipients are feeling um, very energetic. And uh, so we'll have to see in the course of a phase two clinical trial. In a phase one clinical trial, you know, you're not allowed to do double-blinded uh, placebo-controlled um, like you are in a phase two. For first in human, you're you have to give it to every single person and see if it's safe. And that's what we're doing as our primary goal. But, um, you know, we need to do the double-blinded randomized work, of course, to see truly what effect this is having. The It certainly looks in these elderly people that have no business getting bigger muscles. Um, it looks like it's working. But to be completely sure, we need larger numbers of people in a phase two and a phase three clinical trial, of course. But that's the path of drug development. But so the, the improvement, 
which is great. And, and across all these different aspects, uh, how do we know that it's related to the immune system? I mean, could it just be that the younger factors are just making the body feel younger and, and behave younger or systemic sure. rather than the Yeah, no, that's a very good question. We take the blood from these humans that are in our clinical trial receiving immuna every two weeks for three months, and we take it before they are getting our drug. And for every blood draw, we assess the blood for 1,000 different things. Mm -hmm. And um, they, it is an immune profile panel. So we know for certain after they are injected with immuna that their immune system is fundamentally changed. And we can see you know, dozens of factors going up and down and, uh, you know, the different families of extreme pro-inflammation starting to drop down in concert. So we certainly know that it has an immune modulating effect. We've also looked at uh, epigenetic profiling and we can mm -hmm. see that we're turning on and turning off different families of, of um, gene expression. So for example, mm -hmm. in the muscle or blood, we're seeing a... Um, an increase in pro-regenerative and anti-inflammatory gene expression and uh, in our treated, um, treated humans, and then a suppression of um, anti-regenerative and um, anti-inflammatory um, uh, markers. So we're, we're kind of, it seems to be pushing down the, the expression of genes that are associated with um, degradation and, and uh, degeneration and pushing up the genetics that are related to regeneration and uh, anti-inflammation.